All right. And we are live. So those of you that are hanging out in the YouTube chat, give me a yay or a nay on the audio. All right. <laughs> uh, is this live? Yeah, this is live. And why is DT screaming? Uh, I didn't do anything weird with the audio levels. I am because most of my audio, of course, is done with hardware and I haven't played with any knobs or anything. So <laughs> let me make sure Pulse Audio hasn't freaked out. No, everything's at a normal 100%. So, so check it on your end. All right, lots of yays. Uh, let's see what kind of chat has been going on before the stream here. Let's see. Truly interested in DTOS. Yeah, we may play around with DTOS today. I'm actually not sure what I'm going to do today. I, I, I titled the stream Working on Xmonad, Emacs, and DTOS, and we may work on other stuff too. The thing is, uh, I didn't have much uh, time to do anything today as far as uh, video content or I, I really got some other things going on in life so I had like a two hour block of time in the afternoon to where I could fit in you know a live stream and I thought that would be great because I actually don't do these kinds of live streams that often typically you'll only get one or two of these a month from me usually just one a month. You know, I try to force myself to do at least one of these a month you know most of my content of course is pre-recorded um, and I typically, when I do these live streams, it's for the reason I'm doing it today is because I just don't have time to actually uh, record a proper video and edit it, you know, which is an all day kind of job. So I actually have to uh, be somewhere in about two hours. So the live stream today, we're probably going to go about 90 minutes. Typically, I go about an hour and a half for these because that's a good time. I find that that's an hour and a half. It's not too long for me. I, I, like I'm. You know, I'm not uh, you know, like two hours is starting to stretch it. You know, maybe you need a drink. Maybe you need to go take a bathroom break. Three hours is way too long. And those people that do four five, six hour streams, I don't understand how those people do it. I really don't. And as far as consuming the content, I've noticed for at least for myself, you know, even audio podcasts, you know, 30 minutes is a good time. An hour is OK. Uh, two hours, man, that's that's a lot of time somebody would have to dedicate to actually watch or listen to that whole thing. Because remember, of course, a lot of people are not going to catch the live stream. They'll catch it on, you know, a rerun, basically, right? They'll, they'll catch it after the fact. And a lot, if I'm one of those people, I see somebody I, I'm interested in, you know, made a, a live stream. Oh, let me watch their live stream. And then I notice it's three hour and 45 minutes long. Well, I don't have that kind of time. So I just skip it, right? I find an hour and a half is a, a good time. Uh, let's see. Uh, interested in DWM. Uh, you use Sway. Can DWM be compiled for Wayland? No, DWM is strictly for the uh, X server, for Xorg. So all our standard window managers that are for Xorg, they work on Xorg. They don't work on Wayland. That's just completely different display servers. Uh, for our window manager to work on Wayland, it has to be written specifically for Wayland. So there is a DWM clone that they're working on for Wayland. Uh, I think it's called DWL. Could be wrong about that. Yeah, somebody actually followed up and that is DWL. Yeah. Qtile is working to make Qtile work on both Xorg. Of course, it works on Xorg and Wayland. So when you install Qtile, you'll actually have two Qtile sessions in your login manager. When you, you know, do the drop down, you'll see Qtile and then you'll see Qtile and then out in parentheses Wayland for those of you that want to try Qtile on Wayland. But it's still early days for it. They'll get there, though. A lot of people work on Qtile. They have a pretty good development team. Uh, let's see. Yes, some Qtile talk here. Yeah, great to have you live on a Tuesday. <laughs> All right. Uh, Big Pod says hello. How you doing, Big Pod? Yeah, audio is okay. A million yays. Yeah, the people that actually stream for multiple hours, they too take uh, bio breaks and such. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Especially the ones that do like the eight hour streams, 10 hour streams. 
Now, I mean, at some point you have to have a meal, right? At some point you got to eat, you got to drink. Like you, uh, There are things you've got to do other than just sit at the computer and stream. Uh, let's see. Hey, DT, you're going to make an update to Xmonad 0.17 soon. It broke my config and I could not find a solution to fix the main equals do uh, XM proc stuff. Okay. Yeah, as soon as it's available in Arch, I'll update it to uh, the latest version of Xmonad. I'm not going to go out of my way to compile the latest version of Xmonad because it's going to work on my system, but it's not going to work for those of you guys that are using DTOS. So it doesn't make sense for me to compile it myself, you know, build it using Stack or Cabal or anything like that. I'm just going to wait until it's actually in the Arch repos, and when it's there, then I'll move to it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to have two different configs, you know, for the, the ones that want to compile to get to the new version of Xmonad or the ones that are still using the version in the Arch repos. So it would just cause way too many headaches. So as soon as it's available in the Arch repos, that's when I'm going to move to it. As far as your, your error, obviously, you know, that's one of those things. If you're having an error, in your Xmonad config, you're, you're going to need to post the config in a proper support form where somebody can inspect the code. Now, there is an Xmonad subreddit, r slash Xmonad. That would be a good place, place to uh, post your question and post a link to a paste bin that actually has your config. And you probably get a response how to fix that error that day. You know, the Xmonad subreddit is pretty active. Are you going to update the Xmonad config to make it use the new features? Yeah, once it's available, I'll, I'll see. Uh, there's really not a, a lot of new features in, the, I mean, the big release, because it's, it's the new Xmonad release when it's available in Arch is going to have a lot of new features. I'm not sure I necessarily need any of them. Uh, the window swallowing feature, I might play around with and, and add that. Um, there's also an org mode uh, widget <laughs> available as well. I'm not sure what that is going to be. I haven't really researched it, but I do use org mode in Emacs, obviously. And uh, so I, I may make that part of the config as well, especially for T DTOS, which is Xmonad plus Emacs. Let's see. Yeah, Big Pod, today I opened a new chapter in my life. Okay. <laughs> Uh, did you switch to Gentoo or what's going on there, Big Bud? Yeah. Uh, Alex says, thanks so much for the Xmonad content. Yeah. House multi-monitor support with Xmonad has always been fantastic. That was really, uh, one of the big things when Xmonad was first created, you know, nearly 20 years ago, it's perfect for multi-monitor systems. So. All right, let me switch over to the desktop. And like I said, I have no idea what I'm going to do today. <laughs> I just knew I could be here for about two hours today. So I'm just going to open up a config and let's play around with something. So uh, let's start by looking at my Xmonad config. And I'll zoom in a little bit here so you guys can see. Uh, let's see. I've got some notes off to the side here of some things one of the things i worked on the other day of course you guys saw the ability to where i can now change my color schemes by simply changing one line here so i have these new libraries these haskell libraries that i created myself they're not complicated they're just color schemes and i created these 10 new libraries and then I just import the one that I want. Import colors.doom1, for example, for the Doom 1 colors. Or I could change that to, I mean, I could change that to Nord. Let me recompile. Let me org babble tangle and then restart. And that is Nord here in the XMO bar. You see this Nord colors, no longer Doom 1 colors. Treyer also gets the same effect. And if I switch my monitor view here I wasn't set up to show you this other monitor but you see the cocky also changed to the nord colors it was the doom one colors so that is how we accomplish that so 
what I was thinking about doing the other day after the video, I said it, it would be great if I modified this in such a way to where I didn't have to manually come in here, change that line and then recompile Xmonad to get that effect. Wouldn't it be cool if I created a script, maybe a D menu script that listed the 10 options. And then once I choose an option, then it through the magic of set or alt, you know, changes this value for me. And then of course, recompiles Xmonad for me as well. So, and let me launch a new instance here. And I can't remember where I put this script. I th I'm pretty sure I put it in uh, .local slash bin DTOS dash color scheme. There it is. And I've already actually pushed this, I think, to DTOS already. No, I'll have to double check that. If, if it's not in DTOS already, it'll probably be there later this evening when I have time to make a push. But it's very simple. Just a very simple bash script. So I have a options array here listing out the names of those Xmonad modules, right? Those libraries. And then I pipe all of those into D menu. And if choice, meaning whatever I choose from the D menu, uh, then we're going to, through the magic of Sid, change the line import colors and whatever the rest of the line is. So you see the period star that means I find a line that is import colors and we don't care what comes after colors just go to the end of the line then replace that with choice so it'll be you know one of these words well actually replace it with import colors dot choice yeah then after it does that uh, it's going to do that in both my readme.org the literate config and the xmonad.hs uh, file itself and then we're going to run a xmonad space dash dash restart so if i run this so since it's in a uh, local bin and local bin is in my path i can just run it from the terminal there and you see choose color scheme doom one dracula yada 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 let's do solarized dark and you see Xmo bar changed all the colors are now the solarized dark colors. Trayer now is using the solarized dark background. Conky changed off screen to a solarized dark conky. Let me go back to the Doom 1 colors that I was using. So that's something I've worked on a little bit last night. Uh, that actually... The hard part was creating the custom Xmonad uh, libraries. You know what I did the video on the other day, the Bash script, just to you know pipe all of this into D menu. This took all of about five minutes, right? It's not a very complicated script at all. Yeah, I don't know why that <laughs> restarts every time. Uh, I'm having a problem with this particular scene in OBS. Give me just a second, guys. Let me go into. Uh, the properties here. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, okay. Now, when I switch to this screen, it shouldn't reload that up, uh, the YouTube chat every time like it was doing. And that's actually annoying. There's a little tick box in the OBS uh, bin browser plugin that I'm using that actually gets me this YouTube chat on screen here. And apparently I had accidentally ticked the box to where it reloads this every time I switch to this scene where it should just stay where it's at. All right, let me catch up on some of the chat or we find anything else to play with here. A big pod got a job. <laughs> well, that is a big life change. Congratulations. Uh, DT, will you react to the newest Linux challenge from Linus Tech Tips? I doubt it. That's not something I care to do. I really didn't care to do the last one, but people asked about it. And uh, the second part of this challenge I actually found interesting because there were so many, you know, mistakes and things. And it was, uh, I, I enjoyed actually watching their video. <laughs> so I enjoyed the reaction to it as well. Uh, but no, it's not something I plan to to do. Not just with Linus's videos, but I mean, most people's videos. You know, I don't care to react to other people's content. Let's see. Um, will you show us Motif or TWM? 
two dependencies only they need. So I'm assuming with, uh, yeah, TWM, Tom's window manager, the default XORG window manager. I, I briefly showed it on video before many years ago. But it's not it's not a window manager anybody's really going to use. And there's no reason to use it because you're talking about dependencies. I mean, DWM doesn't really have any dependencies. <laughs> Just install that. <laughs> like, uh, uh, the awesome window manager. I mean, if you already had Lua on the system, really doesn't have any dependencies either. Qtile has some Python dependencies, but depending on, again, the system you're installing it on, may not be that many dependencies. Openbox has no dependencies. Like I can find a real window manager to install that has no dependencies. Uh, so I don't have to use Tom's window manager because it is horrid. <laughs> like it's so bad. Uh. All right. Yeah, sorry. I missed out on some of the chat here, guys. A lot of stuff going on. The chat's flying by. Will you make a video on minimal version of Emacs? Uh, good news, Zyle. I have not heard of it, so I don't know, <laughs> but I, I'll make a note of it, but I don't know. Uh, some people ask me about things all the time that I haven't heard of, so I mean, I can't really tell you one way or another, but I will make a note of GNU Zyle. Um... Uh, but I mean, obviously, these days, I, I'm happy with Doom Emacs. Like, it does everything I could possibly want a distribution of Emacs to do. So, I'm not really looking to move anywhere. Uh, DT, do you ever take snapshots of VM's Invert Manager? It was broken in a previous version, and it put me off of it. Curious to know if it works for you. I don't do snapshots that often. Uh... I haven't noticed it being broken, though, when I have used it in the past, but you're saying that it's a, a recent thing with it, so I don't know. Uh, DT, I love the idea of lib slash colors. Might be on the still GitLab issue. Oh, yeah, okay. Jason here, the, the guy made that comment. Yeah, he posted a, a bug on my uh, GitLab for my xmonad config because one of the colors was missing. When I did the, the initial push, I realized I only pushed nine of the 10 color modules. And I went back and pushed the other one later. And uh, <laughs> it caused him some problems because he just happened to you know, pull my configs down before I pushed the correction. Let's see, have you ever, cons well, I, I was reading something and then the chat jumped. Uh, sorry about whoever that was. Let me find it. Uh, well, this is annoying. <laughs> I guess I should slow down to the, the chat. I was reading something, and then I lost what I was reading. Anyway. Uh, let's see, John. So, the terminal colors and icons, personal preference, preference, or do they serve a purpose? The terminal color schemes, and, you know, all, all of this stuff... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's personal preference. Uh, you just use what looks good for you. Some people like more contrast. Some people like less contrast. Like Doom 1, I find, you know, has a nice little bit of contrast where that Nord color scheme, which is very popular, a lot of people like it. It's really low contrast. And for me, I don't particularly like it, but a lot of people like those low contrast color schemes. And then of course, some people like light color schemes <laughs> most people hate light color schemes uh, you just gotta find what works for you work works for your eyes the best i mean yeah it's all personal preference that's why i'm including 10 color schemes right now for for everything so so i've made 10 different color schemes now for xmonad xmobar cocky trayer uh, Alacrity, the uh, multicolor SDDM theme, um, and of course, Doomy Max also has all of these color schemes, but those were already built into Doomy Max. I didn't have to add them. So. so I've got pretty much everything covered as far as the color schemes, and eventually what I need to do is the script. Right now, the script is changing the one value here in my Xmonad config. That value changes the Xmonad colors, the Xmobar colors, the Treyer color, 
and the uh, cocky color because all of that is in my Xmonad config. But what isn't in my Xmonad config is the Emacs colors because that's just not a part of my Xmonad config. Um, the alacrity colors and the uh, login colors, the uh, multicolor SDDM theme colors. So eventually what I need to do with this script is other than changing that value in uh, the Xmonad config, I also need to change some values in the Alacrity config. So those color changes take effect in Alacrity. And that's a simple enough thing. I could probably do that on camera today. I eventually need to figure out how I want to change the color scheme in Doom Emacs and have Doom Emacs reload. And that will be a little trickier. Uh, changing the theme in the multicolor SDDM theme is pretty simple. That, that's another one, kind of like the alacrity thing. It's usually just me with Sid substituting something in one file, and it should take effect. Let me catch back up on some of this chat here because there was a super chat. Uh, Russell. He says, have you considered making a video on how to use or convert to FOSS for businesses? I'd totally be willing and paying customer, participant, and client. Okay, I've had people ask about this before. And um, I would be willing to talk to you about it. And if, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to be on a video, I mean, it, it, I think it would be a interesting content. So I, I certainly don't mind that. Uh, as far as, you know, uh, paying me, you know, like a, you're my client or something like I'm selling a service. I don't know about that because at that point, then I'd have to, I don't know. There's no guarantees with this kind of stuff. Like, I don't know anything about your business. Chances are it's going to be a business I've never worked in. Um, but as far as false for business, I mean, what kind of software? Let me ask you right now in the chat, Russell, and you can... Uh, post it. What kind of proprietary software are you using on a daily basis that you think is going to be a challenge to move away from? And I can give you some suggestions. And not just me. I mean, we have 150 people here in the chat, right? And they, they can also give you some suggestions. ADT, when you have all the uh, document DTOS documentation. I'm assuming that when will you have all the DTOS documentation? Well, technically, the documentation is already there because it's the source code, right? Just <laughs> read the, uh, oh, well, I mean, that's that's kind of like the suckless documentation, right? Yeah, just go read my uh, Doomy Max config, my Xmonad config, and all of that. But I, I put some documentation up a little bit. Let me see. Um, Oh, if you go to distro.tube, this is not great documentation, but uh, I mean, initially I've put some documentation, mainly how to install the script, right? One of the most common questions I get, and I added this recently, I also tell you where all the source code for everything is, because there's several different repos of stuff that are involved in DTOS. So I have the DTOS repository, which is the script itself. Then I have the DTOS core, DTOS core repo, which is the Arch repository of my builds and my binaries that get installed when you like do a sudo pacman syu. You know where where do all those DTOS packages come from? They come from the DTOS core repo. Then I have DTOS dash package build, which is something most of you guys are not going to be interested in. That's mainly for me. That's the package builds that are used to create the binaries that go into DTOS core repo. And then I have uh, DTOS dash configs, and this is a repository strictly of the config files that get placed in slash Etsy slash DTOS. So you'll find all the configs, bash, zsh, uh, xmonad, dot xmonad, dot local slash bin, which contains all the scripts, um, dot config and then alacrity cocky the dm scripts uh, doomy max of course cute browsers here xmo bar and then the, the big thing people ask is about updates uh, it's just an arch based distro right, right so it's my uh 
repo gets added. So just sudo pacman syu, and you're always going to have the latest packages, right? The thing is, the latest and greatest packages, you have to understand any package that begins with DTOS dash. So if you do a sudo pacman syu, and it updates to the latest version of my xmonad config, which is DTOS dash xmonad, you got to understand, it installs my new configs, but it doesn't install them in the home directory. For one thing, Pac-Man can't do that. You're really not allowed to touch the home directory when you install software using Pac-Man and Arch. It's kind of against the rules. The other thing is, even if it was allowed, I wouldn't want to do that because it would just overwrite your existing configs. Say you heavily modified my config, and now I install my latest config and it overwrites all the changes you've already made. You're not going to be happy. So. DTOS-xmonad in this case, what it does is installs my new xmonad configs in slash etsy slash DTOS slash dot xmonad. You go in there if you want the latest config and you go and copy it yourself over to the home directory. That way, if you overwrite something, you did it. I didn't do it. <laughs> so, uh, back to the chat here. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I, I the chat is acting a little funny. It skipped ahead and then it skipped way back. Let's see. All right. Uh, Russell responded here. Oh, and thanks for the super chat again, Russell. He says, the biggest challenge for me is e-sign for contracts. However, I completely understand the nature of consulting and still am good with paying to support. I can DM on DistroToot to continue the conversation. Um... Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about e-sign or in contracts. It's not something. Okay, I've I've never interacted in that world, Russell. No. So I don't think I could help you with that, to be honest. But I mean, you can always ask questions. Um, and yeah, you can DM me on Distrotoot. So but usually the DMs, yeah, I get notifications. So that's not a problem. Let's see. Um, and, and you guys in the chat, if you have any idea about what he's talking about with the e-sign for contracts, you have any uh, suggestion, suggestions as far as false alternatives, free and open source alternatives? Let's see. Keep it diggy. How you doing, Josh? Yeah, good to see you live. Yeah, I try to do do at least one live a month. It keeps me honest, right? <laughs> you can't hide mistakes on live videos, right? I used to do a lot more live streams. You know, in the early days of the channel, and I always found that you know these were were cool because I, I can just turn on a camera, turn on a microphone, and I can start talking and I have no problems, you know, talking, never having dead air, dull moments. You know, I, I, I can keep you guys entertained for an hour or two, no problem, right? So I've always found live streaming, I found it easy, which is weird that I don't do it as much these days. Um, Barry says, Linux, my preferred daily driver for 20 plus years. Just last month, I switched to Xmonad on my laptop and work desktop. Really like it. Thanks, DT, for the helpful videos. Appreciate that. And let me, uh, I'm going to step away from the chat here because we're going to do some stuff on camera. Let's go ahead and actually do some stuff on camera here. Let me turn on the uh, truncated lines here. So what I'm going to do is, so this DTOS dash color scheme script, which all it does is runs, well, all it does is runs this D menu script, allows me to select a color scheme, and then that color scheme gets changed in my Xmonad config automatically. So, uh, what I want to do now is, what I want to do is get to the point where this also changes a value in my alacrity config. So, let me open up my alacrity config. I'll just open it in Emacs. I'll zoom in here a little bit. And in my Alacrity config, P, 
page down. So here are the color schemes. So I have all 10 color schemes in my Alacrity config. There's Doom-1. But somewhere in here is a line that actually sets the color scheme. Okay, here it is. Colors, colon, space, asterisk, Doom-1. So what I want to do is I want to probably with Sid again, since I was using Sid to do this in the Xmonad config, just with Sid, look for that line and then change that to the appropriate value. So move this here. Uh, the problem is the values are not going to be the same. It's the problem. See, so the names are different. These are lowercase and they have hyphens, dashes. The Haskell modules, I used standard Haskell syntax, meaning that they're capitalized words at the beginning, and you know, each word should be capitalized within it, like Doom, and then one is capitalized. No spaces, no dashes as part of the module names. Uh, Hmm, so I'll have to rethink that. I mean, I, I could do a complicated, like, if-then statement where if choice is this Doom one, then I could tell Sid exactly what to import instead of importing the choice. I could actually tell it exactly what to import. Hmm. But then I would have, yeah, I'd probably have to change this whole thing then. Yeah, I don't want to change change all of that right now because right now this is at least working for the Xmonad config, so I don't want to break it. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Or I could create a new array with these options, just a, a second array with these options. Yeah, that's, I, I thought that would be easier than what it was because I had actually thought the names in this array would be the same as here. I could make them the same in the Alacrity config. <laughs> that would probably actually be the easiest thing is just change all of this to these values. I th you know what? Yeah, somebody in the chat, that's a case statement would also, yeah, a case statement would work. Mm -hmm. I'd have to have, you know, 10 different cases, though, is the only thing. See, this made it easy because choice, you know, is just substituted. Or because I have the different values here. I think the easiest thing would be to just change all of this to these. I think that's what I'm going to do. So let's since it'll be exactly the same. What was I doing? I was doing a uh, rev box dark monikai pro no dash Nord. Oceanic next. Pale Knight, I just used capital P, yeah. Solarized Light. Because I, I need the uh, syntax here to respect, you know, the way Haskell typically does things. That's why I didn't use dashes and why I had everything capitalized. I mean, it doesn't matter how it's spelled or capitalized in the Alacrity config. You know, there's no real standard, right? So it just makes sense just to change this. It'll, it'll just make things a lot easier. Of course, that was just uh, some comments, right? I actually need to change the real values themselves. So I'm just going to scroll up here. And tomorrow night is set right here. Let's change that. now going to be tomorrow night, the capital T, 
capital N and no dash. Let's see, solarized light. I'm going to have a whole lot of changes to push, too. I'm going to have to rebuild pretty much all the packages for DTOS after this. Because I'm going to have to uh, rebuild all the binaries. So we're going to have a lot of packages for DTOS that are going to get updated today. <laughs> uh, so, Pell Knight. This needs to be uh, P. Uh, Mist Oceanic next. Yeah. Tedious to ha have to go through here and change all of this. But this is a lot quicker than having to make a giant case statement with 10 different cases. Or, you know, if then with, you know, 10 different ifs. <laughs> this is a lot easier. Just having everything named exactly the same. I probably should do this in everything. Just have them all exactly the same format. Conky, uh, the login manager, anything that where I set a color scheme. I should probably just go ahead and change all of them to the way that they're listed as far as the X monad modules we, we created. Uh. All right. Let me launch Alacrity, see if I made any errors. I must have made an error. So, I'm going to scroll, so make sure I didn't miss anything. So, we set Doom 1. We set Dracula. Set Grovebox Dark. Monokai Pro. Nord. Oceanic Next. Hell Knight. Solarized Dark. Solarized Light. And Tomorrow Night. And then, ah, here's the error. Now, we need to actually set this to Doom 1. We write that, relaunch Alacrity, now it works. All right. So, that is my new Alacrity config. <laughs> I'll have to push that later to my dot .files. And now, What I want to do is Sid, and we're going to substitute, what was the line? Colors, colon, asterisk, name of color scheme. So, colors, colon. And I don't think anything else has colors, colon in it. Let me do a search. Colors colon if I did a search there are two two lines that contain that string but the only one that has colors colon at the beginning of the line is the correct one so I could do a uh, caret symbol for the beginning of the line col colors colon space and then what do we want to change that to well we want to oh we got to signify the rest of the uh the line here. Colors colon. And that needs to be choice. What am I doing here? We have to specify a file. That needs to be in home slash dot config slash alacrity slash alacrity dot yml. The only thing is not, we have to add an asterisk in the name here. So 
We actually need an asterisk. Do I have to escape that? I'm pretty sure I probably do. Well, let's run this and see. So now if I choose Monokai Pro, see if Sid actually replaces the colors line in my Alacrity config. It, well, we know it did. I don't even have to go to the config to see because you saw the terminal actually change. If I choose Grubbox Dark, that may have been the one I chose before, or it's just very similar. No, I don't think it's working. Not quite working the way I expected. Where was that line? The colors line. I guess I could have searched for it. There it is. Ah, it inserted the carrot symbol. Okay. All right. How'd you guys let me make that mistake? The carrot. <laughs> uh. I know I've missed a lot of chat. I, I do apologize, guys. I can pause here for a second and catch up on the chat. Well, there's no way I can catch up on all of it. I, I know I missed hundreds of messages. I do apologize. <laughs> Um, could you make a script that uses the install command to copy the script over and make a backup of the old config if it's there? Uh, once again, I can't really do anything in a user's home directory. So, um, when you make packages for Arch and when Pac-Man installs them, uh, the package builds themselves, but they just don't allow you to play in the user's home directory. So I can't really do anything with your config files through installing a package. Now I could create a script that you guys can run yourselves to do that. But no, I can't create a, an actual installable program to do that. Uh, hey DT, what kind of music do you listen to? Uh, mostly 70s and 80s rock and uh, classical music. Usually the genres that I listen to the most. Let's see. Uh, crazy chicken. Just put user bin, ENV, run GHC at the top of the script. You had to make a Haskell script. Yeah. For simple scripting, just make it a bash script, right? Yeah, I, I've actually thought about doing some things, not necessarily with Haskell scripting, but like when I get into needing to modify Doom Emacs, for example, you know, what I may end up doing is actually creating an Emacs Lisp script, which is similar. You know, it's just changing the shebang to the appropriate Emacs Lisp shebang. And then, uh, yeah, we, well, I may end up doing that. I, I can't imagine I'm going to do any scripting with Haskell uh, as far as, you know, like a script outside of the Xmonad config itself. I do have some things I would like to do in Haskell inside the Xmonad config itself at some point. If I had the Haskell skills, I'll talk about that later. Yeah, it seems like Emacs needs a change all function. And that was from John. Let's see. Uh, DT with facial hair over DT without facial hair. Okay. Uh, I try to keep you guys guessing. You never know if I'm going to show up with hair or not. DT, can you rap for us? Uh, not on this live stream. Maybe the next one. <laughs> uh. let's see elisp scripting would be cool yeah what i'm thinking about doing is because i need to change the theme automatically also in doom emacs but it's the typical way to do that is an interactive command what i need to be able to do is set out you know, you with Sid replace a line in my Doom Emacs config, and then run a Emacs command, which is the reload 
Emacs command. And I don't know if I can do that without actually doing that in Emacs Lisp. So I probably, I probably do have to do that as an Emacs Lisp script. But I don't know. I mean, at some point, I'll, I'll work all of that out. Okay, let's see. Let's get back to this. Let's see what the problem here was with Sid. Uh, let's see, we Sid, beginning of the line, colors, colon, and then everything after that to the end of the line. We replace that with, we didn't need that. So, looking like a pretty simple mistake to fix, pretty easy mistake to make especially when you're doing things fast. Now let's change to solarized light. Of course, it didn't change my alacrity config because we already had the uh, broken line here. So now let me change to solarized light. Yeah, now it works. And now anytime I do this, if I wanted to go to Dracula, yeah, alacrity changes, Xmo bar changes, off screen, conky changes, trayer changes. So, we're getting real close now to being able to change everything. The only thing we're missing is all these Doom Emacs windows. Right? We need them to change to a solarized dark, which I mean, I could manually do it. But of course, I want it to be able to be done through just this D menu, where when I you know choose something, it just happens. Uh, let's go back to the... Uh, Doom one theme. Um, in the alacrity terminal. There we go. So now that we've got that working for us, the only thing left, I'll make a comment here, or when I come back, is Doom Emacs, <laughs> right? Eventually, I need to do something with Doom Emacs here. So, what I should do here if I go to my Doom config, uh, doesn't look like I've been to it recently. Let's open my Doom config.org. And in the table of contents here, I've got this chapter here, uh, Doom theme. And that is actually where it sets the theme. By default, my config sets Doom-1. Unless I manually change it. But, you know, when I kill Emacs and come back, you know, it's going to be Doom-1 again, right? I need that line change. Let me zoom in. Make sure you guys can read that. So this is the line that I need to, probably with Sid, change that value. Uh, this one though, I'm not going to be able to do like I did with the Alacrity config because I can't change this to capital D Doom, no dash, capital O one, you know, because Doom Emacs is already named these. Hmm. This might be the one that I end up doing something with an Emacs Lisp script. <laughs> so. I'm not going to do that today uh, on camera or anything. Because I imagine I'm going to be fumbling around, especially with my Emacs Lisp skills being kind of rudimentary. But I wanted to let you guys know that's what, what the next project is. That's really the only thing that'll be tricky. Once I'm able to change that and make Doom Emacs automatically reload, how you reload Doom Emacs is there is a reload command. It is uh, if you do meta x doom slash because it's a custom doom module, doom slash reload. That's how that works. And you see I get a terminal and a split letting me know it was reloading doom based on config changes. So that's how if you you know made a change, for example, if I did a, uh, it's Doom dash Nord, the name of the color scheme. Let's see, let's do a Doom slash reload.
Okay. It didn't actually change to that theme. Let me make sure. Yeah. But that is the name of the theme, Doom Dash Nord. And you know, I'm using the uh, Emacs Daemon too. I, I bet I would have to kill the Emacs Daemon, the Emacs server, and restart it too. Yeah, this is going to be tricky how to do this automatically with Doom Emacs. There is also Doom slash restart, which restarts Emacs. But I think that would pretty much kill everything I've already done. Yeah, it would. And I don't think that it's going to... Uh, Yeah, and it doesn't even relaunch it again. And I wouldn't want to do that anyway, because I could kill Emacs where people were actually in the middle of working on it. Well, I'm actually getting some errors. Let me do a Doom Sync. It didn't like something there. Maybe I had an error in my config. Nah, everything looks good. What it is, is I have everything set up to expect the Emacs daemon to be running. And the Emacs daemon wasn't running, that's why it gave me the error, but there's, yeah, works just fine. So. <laughs> yeah, John says, yeah, just cut to the chase and make a total Doom Emacs distro. Uh, you know, I have actually started with GNU Emacs and tried my best to make a GNU, a standard GNU Emacs config that works pretty much like Doom Emacs. I spent almost a month doing that at one point. I didn't show you guys a lot of it on camera. I showed some of it and I still have that config up on my uh, GitLab. If I go to my GitLab. Switch to desktops here. Uh, if you go to my dot files. Yeah, I have this folder here called emacs.d, which is your standard uh, hidden folder in your home folder. Uh, .emacs.d is usually its name. You notice I changed the name to .emacs.d.gnu, letting you guys know this is not my Doom Emacs config. This is a GNU Emacs config that I spent a lot of time on <laughs> trying to make this thing as like Doom Emacs as possible. I pretty much took my Doom Emacs config and tried to rewrite it as best I could in GNU Emacs. And this took a lot of work. And it was more work than, than I probably should have spent on it. I was glad I did it because, you know, it was educational. But at the same time, if everything I want is in Doom Emacs, you know, and I'm trying to basically write GNU Emacs like it's Doom Emacs, one, I just use Doom Emacs, right? Because what was going to happen is I was going to have a, a config file that was like 5,000 lines long because I've got to config so much stuff that's already been configed in Doom Emacs because, you know, they've already got these packaged up as their own custom modules that are already enabled. All right. Back to the chat for a second, guys. My coffee is getting cold, too. I didn't drink my coffee fast enough. I'm kind of disappointed. Let's see. Hey, DT. How's life? <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, everything's good right now. I can't complain. Everything's good. Uh, I feel good mentally, physically. I went to the gym this morning, got a good workout. Yeah. I, I really have no complaints. So, I mean, I guess... That's all you can ask for, right? Is if you don't have any complaints, everything's working out for you. Uh, let's see. How can I grab just your Doom Emacs start screen? Uh, hmm. I guess I should have. You know what? I should just go to a different workspace. And I should just keep my GitLab open because I, I got a feeling we're going to keep coming back to it. Uh, I'll just put a, a browser on this workspace here. So my Doom Emacs start screen is a, actually a program called Dashboard. Uh, it's nothing special. It's nothing necessarily customized. If you go to my dot .files, the, the dot .files repo on my GitLab, go to .config, Doom, and config.org. 
look for a chapter called Dashboard. Uh, GitLab doesn't respect org mode table of contents, so I actually got to scroll down to it. Dashboard. And this is what I'm using. So all you got to do is put that in your config.org or your config.el, depending on how you configuring things. And then in Doom Emacs, you also need to make sure you install the package dashboard. It's actually the name of the, the program. So if I go back in Doom Emacs, what you're going to do is go into packages.el and make sure you have uh, this here. Package, exclamation, space, dashboard. You know, it's just listing all your third-party packages that you want to install. And then do a Doom sync. You know, if you have the Emacs server running, kill it and restart it. And you should have that dashboard. For those of you wondering what he's talking about, this here. This is not the standard dashboard that Doom Emacs uses. Doom Emacs by default uses a much simpler one that is just a Doom Emacs logo. Not this logo, but it's an ASCII art logo. And it has like six or seven useful uh, key bindings, you know, for the new user. Which I kind of kept that in mind. Uh, I, I accomplished that a different way. <laughs> I just add some text at the top. Um, but this dashboard is recent files, agenda items, bookmarks, projects, registers. And of course, you if you don't use like registers, for example, or you don't need it in your dashboard, you can turn that off. You can turn off bookmark. You don't have to see all of this information. You can adjust how many of the items are actually listed as well. Back to the desktop here. I'll go back into config.org. I can actually show you. Well, of course, now Doom 1 uh, goes away and I've got the Nord colors. That's weird. Why all of a sudden did it change where it wasn't changed before? <laughs> uh, and that was strange. I have no idea. At why it changed when I basically went to a different buffer. <laughs> I was not expecting that uh, dashboard. I was going to show you the dashboard settings. So in dashboard, you have uh, set queue, dashboard, dash items, and recents, period, five, meaning I want five recent files listed. And again, the dashboard, you say recent files. I have five of them, my five most recent files. And then agenda, I have five, five most recent agenda items, bookmarks. I'm going to do five bookmarks, projects five, registers five. Again, you can set those to whatever number you like or turn them off if you don't even want to see them. Because some of them you may not want to be seen. Honestly, I probably shouldn't have registers uh, displayed in my dashboard just for safety reasons. Because that's basically registers are like clipboards you know, inside Emacs. You can have multiple registers though. So it's kind of, it's a little bit more powerful than clipboards. But I may be copying uh, sensitive information at times that gets placed in a register. And maybe, maybe I don't want that shown in the dashboard. Well, I don't have to set the registers. You know, I can just... Uh, you know, turn that off or just set registers to show zero items, I guess. All right. Back to the chat here for a second. Yeah. I got excited talking about the, the Emacs dashboard, right? I lost my place in the chat here. Hmm. Uh, hey DT, uh, not sure if you saw my post on your previous video regarding D-menu. D-menu can take parameters, flags for colors. Yeah, yeah. Um, and people mention this all the time. Yeah, I, I know D-menu has the ability from the command line to just take flags for background color, foreground color, and things like that. Uh, that doesn't solve the problem that I'm trying to uh, to do because so many things within DTOS use. Uh, third-party scripts, D-menu scripts, that are going to be run without those flags. So I actually have to change the actual D-menu colors within the D-menu config and recompile is, is how I'm going to have to do that. I, I can't just uh, change color options. I, I would have to edit a million configs to do that. 
And some of them are, are again, not DTOS specific. Um, like my D menu scripts, my DM scripts uh, program, which is a collection of like 25, 30 D menu scripts at this point. I mean, that thing is packaged up. It's in the Arch user repository, the AUR. A lot of people use it, not just on Arch distros, because you can just grab it and install it on any distro, really. I don't want to go in there and have to edit all of those and add specific flags. Some of those flags aren't going to work unless you've got my build of D menu. It, it would just be a problem. So, um, but yeah, uh, that's good for people that don't know. Yeah, D menu ha does have the ability to set foreground color, background color, and all that through the use of flags in the D menu command itself. But I'm I'm gonna have to actually change the color scheme and recompile. Uh, hey DT, could you do some Caden Live video editing content? I have made at least one, maybe two videos uh, about Caden Live. If you're talking about just like the basics of Caden Live and how to use it, and I went into you know some detail. I mean, I know one of them. It's like uh, the basics of Caden Live, and it's like a 30 minute video, but like it, it's good stuff. You know, I cover a lot of stuff rather quickly in it. If you're just new to Caden Live, it'll get you up to speed rather quickly much more quickly than i got up to speed because I, I actually had to learn this stuff myself i've got the basics of caden live i got a video about the basics of gimp for those of you that want to know some gimp tricks as far as like making thumbnails and stuff like that when you video content creators uh, check those out let's see this isn't necessarily related to DDoS, but when trying to install your custom DWM build from your repo, Pac-Man complains about an invalid PGP signature. Is this me doing something wrong? Uh, you're going to have to give me some more information there. As you said, it isn't related to DTOS. So are you doing this within DTOS? Because if you are, then you already have the PGP signature or otherwise you wouldn't have been able to install uh, anything related to DTOS uh, let's see I'm going to do a sudo pacman dash s uh, dwm dash distro tube that should install that from the DTOS core repository. And that failed for some reason. It may be because I have two different uh, DWM dash distro tubes installed. I probably have the one from the AUR also installed. Uh, I could pull up a VM real quick. See, do I have a VM that actually has DTOS installed? I believe this one right here does this Manjaro KDE. So that was the one we did on video the other day uh, about something related to DTOS. So let's just pull up Vert Manager here, Manjaro KDE. Yeah, d this is definitely DTOS, Xmonad, and of course the uh, multicolor SDDM login themes. All right, so welcome to Manjaro. <laughs> uh, let's do sudo pacman dash s. Probably need to update the whole system. So I don't know how old this is. I probably should have done the same thing on my host machine now that I mention it. Uh, can't spill. It, it installs just fine here in this VM of DTOS. Uh, I didn't complain about PGP keys or anything. But again, you, you give me some more information. Were you actually using DTOS? Back to the chat. Let's see. 
I have GNU slash DTOS for two weeks now running on my laptop. Everything works fine, but having problem running Qtile. Well, DTOS doesn't have anything to do with Qtile, so whatever problems you're having with Qtile are going to be your own problems on that. A lot of people, I, I do get GitLab uh, support requests sometimes. Um, I know I had one the other day. I, I didn't actually respond to it. It's one of them things I typically give people a few hours or a day or two to look into their own solutions because the, the person asked a question had nothing to do with DTOS. It said uh, sounds not working in DTOS. DTOS does nothing with Pulse Audio or PipeWire. It's not even a part of the script, right? I just installed X Mode, add Emacs, the fish shell, right? I don't, I don't configure a sound server at all. You know, your distro has already done that. Whatever distro you're installing this on, or if you're installing this on Base Arch, then you need to do that yourself. So, um, and this is going to be the case here with Qtile. Um, whatever problems, yeah. And not that you were implying that DTOS is the problem with your Qtile, but I, I do get that sometimes. Uh, things not working right that are not part of the script, and uh, some people don't understand that. Which I know is kind of confusing, because when you think of DTOS, something like it, you think, well, I've kind of set up the whole system for you, and really, uh, I've just set up like the top 2% of the system, you know, what you see. Uh, most of everything under the hood, that's taken care of by somebody else, you know, not me. Hmm. Let's see. Would you reveal your opinion on PHP in general? PHP 8.1 recently released as modern programming language. So I, back when I used to play around with some web dev stuff, building websites, you know, way back in the day, uh, I just not doesn't interest me anymore. Hasn't interested me, interested me in at least a decade now. I just kind of. I'm tired of the web, the World Wide Web. But yeah, I know a little PHP, you know. Uh, it's an okay language to work with. Uh, beyond that, I, I'm not sure uh, what you're asking. Like a PHP, kind of think of kind of like Python. Like it's a real easy language to work with. It's a real easy language to understand what's going on when you read. A script, you know exactly what's going on in the file. And I kind of like that. <laughs> so, because not all languages are like that. Haskell's not like that <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. I try to make my Xmonad config with a million comments so everybody knows what's going on. But if I didn't have those comments there, it'd be really hard to tell what's going on in some of that stuff. Uh. Uh, let's see. English Bob, how you doing, EB? He says, hey, Derek, just purchased a lime green mankini. Looking forward to your live streams and it giggles. So I normally don't wear mankinis. Uh, it's getting kind of cool here in Louisiana. I mean, it never gets cold, but I mean, it got down around 50 today. That's 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 not mankini weather, right? Things tend to shrink when it gets that cold. I, I wouldn't be caught dead in a mankini today. Uh, hey, DT, what are your thoughts on rounded corners? Corners. Rounded corners for uh, like your, just your standard windows, like you're, you're talking about like your GTK themes and things like that. I can take them or leave them. Uh, personally, it doesn't matter to me. Honestly, things like that. I know a lot of people are really OCD about little things with theming and things like that. I, I'm not. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I really don't care. I don't care if my uh, windows are perfectly square like they are now, or if they have some uh, rounded uh, corners, some border radius on the corners. Hey, hey, that's fine too. It doesn't matter. Same thing with the panels. Uh, you know, some people like to offset their their bars, their panels a little bit, and round the corners off, and hey, it looks good. I, I, I'm good with it. If you're good with it. Like I said, it, it's either way for me. I don't care. Uh, yeah, you have Pro Pulse Audio working and Bluetooth. 
I'm not sure who that was, but hey, if you have Pulse Audio working, you've accomplished something. That's good. I wish I could say the same. Uh, did I watch Linus Part 3, the Linux Gaming Challenge Part 3? I started watching a little bit of it the other day. I caught like the first five or ten minutes of it, but it was like a half hour long video. I didn't have time to watch the whole thing. But it looked like they had a lot easier time with the uh, I was trying to use basic like office kind of software than they were trying to get the gaming stuff working. Uh, so Herbert was at, just asking about PHP because I defended Python. Okay. So, yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> what the connection is there. <laughs> well, what I, I, I don't trash Python, so you thought maybe I'd trash PHP? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't. I said this is a fine language. I mean, to work in, to program stuff in. Uh, beyond that, hey, whatever. Uh, my uh, my only complaint with PHP is not. I, I don't have any complaints with PHP itself. I have pl complaints with the modern web, modern websites that use PHP and databases, and uh, many of them are slow. And I don't know. These days, it's, it's just a chore to browse the web. I don't know if anybody else feels like that, but years ago, it seemed like the web was faster. Sites just loaded faster, right? And things, it, it was different back then, before the entire web was dominated by basically four companies. Hey, DT, have you looked into Emacs with native comp compilation? I have not. Let's see, thoughts on public cloud computing, AWS, Azure, and so on. I do have a, an account with AWS. I use a S3 storage, and it's fine. It's what I do for uh, backing up my video data. So video backups. I, I got so much video. I don't have enough hard drive space to you know, store all of this stuff. I use S3 for that. And I'm only doing 1080p videos, right? If I did 4K videos, then it's really like four times the storage. I wouldn't need, like, I'd need even more storage. Now, storing video is expensive. You know, it takes up a lot of space. And I've made a lot of videos, though. So, I mean, I've made nearly like 1,100 videos at this point. Yeah, started streaming 69 minutes ago. Nice! <laughs> Uh, yeah, back to whatever I was doing on the desktop here. Uh, so let's see what we want to work with. I really didn't have anything planned for Emacs. One thing, when I finally do uh, push the latest Emacs config for DTOS, one thing I, I noticed the other day I didn't have enabled by default and I know I always enable it, you know, when I'm working with hex color values, is rainbow mode. Let me zoom in. So what is rainbow mode? Well, rainbow mode is... Let me launch a file where I can actually show you. Uh, there we go. So the hex colors, right? They get displayed as their actual color values. And that is so nice, right? That is like extremely nice to have. And it's so nice, I want that available everywhere. And it's not. By default, rainbow mode is built into Emacs, but you always have to turn it on anytime you go to a file that has hex color values. You do meta X and you do rainbow dash mode, right? <laughs> to turn it on or turn it off if you wanted to turn it off for some reason. So I'm constantly having to turn it on. I want it on all the time. So you can define a globalized minor mode inside Emacs. What this does, it creates a new minor mode that is available globally. I'm going to call it global-rainbow-mode. And what does it do? Well, it essentially just does rainbow mode. <laughs> right? it's, it's a new globalized minor mode called global rainbow mode. It's essentially just rainbow mode. Then we have a lambda function here. A lambda function is a, basically an anonymous function. I, I don't want to get 
deep into that, but you know, it's whenever you create a function and it really doesn't need a name, <laughs> it's a Lambda function. Uh, rainbow mode one, turn on rainbow mode, basically. Uh, anyway, so now in my version of Doom Emacs, no matter what mode you're in, org mode, Haskell mode, Python mode, whatever document you're working in, if it finds a hex color value, you're gonna get the hex color displayed. So I want that thing turned on all the time, no matter what I'm working in. And I hope you guys do too, because if you're using DTOS, you're gonna get it. So that's one thing, uh, one minor thing that I added to my config about a week or so ago. It may already be in DTOS. If it's not, when I push the new builds out here in the next uh, few hours, I'll have to have some time later this evening. Certainly by tomorrow morning, you guys will probably have all the new configs. And that D menu script that can change the color schemes, I'll have to add a key binding for it. Actually, let's go ahead and make sure we take care of that now. So, let's go down to the key bindings here. It's a list of key bindings. And I have a section that is strictly D menu scripts. I've got so many key bindings. Here they are. These are all the D menu scripts. Of course, these are all part of DM scripts, the DM scripts package, other than this one here, DTOS dash color scheme, which is super P followed by C. And that is where we can change the color scheme. Super P followed by C, <laughs> right? So it's already in my uh, xmonad config here. I just need to push that to the xmonad config that's part of DTOS. And again, I'll probably get to that when I leave here after the stream. I actually have some place to be uh, for a few hours, but when I get home later this evening, I'll try to build all the binaries and get that pushed to DTOS. All right, back to the chat. Let's see what I missed here. Let's see, Mark. Hi, Chad. Hi, DT. I don't know who Chad is. Maybe you met. Hi, Chad. <laughs> Hi, Chad. Hi, DT. My sub, like, two months ago, watching your videos frequently, like four videos, videos a week. Thanks, you, for catching me up. Another's up. Exploring the Linux world. It's like Alice down the rabbit hole. All right. Appreciate that, Mark. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying uh, Linux if you're new. May I ask, which key binding do you use to push back to tiling? All right. So if I want to make something float here in Xmonad, I just grab it with the mouse, right? I hold the super key and then I right click on the mouse and then I just drag to change the width, or, or I could do super left click of the mouse and just drag it around. That's how you do floating windows. And if I want to push it back into tiling mode, I do super T. So real easy to do. Let me open up a few windows. So I, I want to grab this terminal window, put it in floating mode, do whatever I want with it, have it in the forefront because I don't need to see the other stuff right now. I just drag it, resize it, work on what I need to work with. And then when I'm done with it, but I still need it, you know, I just don't need it up front. Well, Super T puts it back into the tiling layout. So. All right. I appreciate the super chat. that's from Antonio. Uh, he didn't leave a question or a comment. If you leave a question or comment, I'll be on the lookout for it, but I do appreciate the super chat. ADT, have you ever tried messing around with the official Emacs source code? I find it quite difficult to delve deep into huge projects like Emacs. I mean, technically, I mean, I look at Emacs source code all the time because it's hard to do anything in Emacs without looking at source code at some point. Um, For example, in Doom Emacs, to get help stuff, it's usually space H. I think in GNU Emacs, it's usually control H or control XH. Uh, I forget what the, the command is, but anyway, 
And I do space H and then uh, F for described function. Functions are essentially programs, right? These are Emacs programs. And say I didn't know what a particular function was. Uh, maybe, maybe I don't know what, uh, what was it? Rainbow mode we were talking about earlier. I could look up rainbow mode. Yeah, the split here, tell me all about it. If I wanted to look at the source code, it'll tell me, hey, rainbow mode is in this program here, rainbow-mode.el, Emacs Lisp. I could actually click on it, and then I get the source code in this top split, where I could go and investigate exactly what this is, right? So, uh, and I, I do this, not all the time, but I often do end up looking at the source code of some of these functions inside Emacs that I don't know about, like I don't know what they are. Or I'm trying to edit something, but I'm not sure how to go about it, so I go look at the actual code for that function. But yeah, obviously it's a massive project. There's so much to Emacs. You can't possibly know everything. You're never going to read all the source code, right? That's, that's never going to happen. Yeah. And at some point, I may do a video on some of the basics of ELISP. Like if you're having, when you say you're having a problem knowing what's going on in the source code, I mean, I can kind of tell you a little bit of how ELISP works. Like I know, you know, how to create a list. You know, I know what a function is. I know how to define a function. Uh, obviously, I mean, going back to uh, what was my previous buffer here? Yeah rainbow mode and like you know I can I can define some custom functions when I need to one I did a while back was this calendar function now I did not create this thing all by myself I, I pulled this from stack overflow uh, I think I m made some minor alterations to it but essentially if you want to create a function in Emacs you know it, it's not complicated now these make it look more complicated than it is, but I mean it's typically it's define, you know, define function, give it a name. If I was doing a custom function, you know, maybe for DTOS, but you know, I'm gonna let you know this is one of DT's custom functions. It's not actually part of Doom Emacs itself. You know, I am creating this, you know, my function, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll give it that name, and you know, then I could. Um, Actually, what does the function do? You know, I don't know. The function could do a, a message. Hello, world, or whatever. You know, obviously, I would have to spell hello world, right? Pretty sure all of that needed to be wrapped in a parentheses. Actually, why don't we just name the function? Hey, why don't we just create a function right now? We'll call it dt slash hello world. And like I was trying to respect the way Haskell wants things uh, spelled syntax-wise for their custom libraries. They want capitalization. They don't want dashes. Emacs Lisp, it's lowercase. And words should be separated by dashes. Like if you do meta x, you know, and you start looking through all the commands, well, <laughs> you get into some longer commands, they'll all be, they'll all involve dashes, right? There's no underscores at all. Underscores not allowed in names. Well, they, they're allowed, but they're frowned upon. So this would actually be a simple function. Let's make it an interactive function. So I believe to make it an interactive function, Meaning I can call it from a meta x. Let's actually see if that's legit code. I'm just going to reload my config just to see if it complains. It didn't. If I do meta x, I do dt slash hello world is there. If I hit enter, look in the mini buffer. It says hello comma world. So that is creating a function in Emacs Lisp. Now let me get rid of all that, <laughs> otherwise it's going to get pushed into the latest version of DTOS. 
people are going to be wondering why they have a hello world function. <laughs> what does that do? And what's the point? But anyway, back to the, you know, I may do some like the basics of Emacs Lisp, show you a little bit of, you know, how to do simple things with Emacs Lisp, at least so you know enough where you can actually edit your Emacs config, because that's really all you need to get to, right? That's kind of like me and Haskell. You know, I know enough Haskell where I can hack on Xmonet. <laughs> that's really all I want to do. I don't want to be a professional, right? I don't want to actually try to get a job as a Haskell dev. You know, I just want to know enough where I can get by on the basics. Yeah, Emacs Lisp, drowning in parentheses since 1980s. Yeah, but it's when you know what everything is, it actually makes sense. Like, it really makes sense. Like, you wonder why everyone, every programming language doesn't just use the, like the, all the parentheses and things. And because... You don't have to worry about proper spacing and indentation with Emacs Lisp, even though you may have a million nested parentheses, because you can just start a new line and space over however you want. You can actually make it really clean to read, right? Like this function here, it's got a lot going on in it. Lots of various lists and other functions within it. You got some loops going on and, you know, but when you actually space that out and again it's not there's no standard format for how you when you break a line or how you space it you just try to do the best you can to make it clean and readable and you know it's not that hard to figure it out once you once you kind of know what's going on let's see Hey, DT, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask you here, but could you talk about Bedrock someday? I don't know anything about Bedrock. <laughs> and I'm not that interested. Bedrock, people ask about it, but I, I, I don't see the purpose of Bedrock at all. Like having a Linux distribution that has the ability to install from multiple distros, package managers. Uh, and maybe the reason I don't see the point is because I'm an Arch user, where I literally, there's nothing I can't get from Arch, <laughs> the actual repos or the Arch user repository. Uh, it's very, very rare to find a piece, a piece of software out there that's actually available in some package manager on Linux that's not already packaged for Arch. It's extremely rare. So maybe that's part of my problem. Maybe I'm spoiled by having so much software available to me. Uh, but yeah, Bedrock just seems like a bad idea. I think it seems like broken system. Yeah, it's got broken system written all over it when you're installing stuff from multiple different package managers. Let's see. Uh, Kumar, is, are you making a beginner-friendly distro or only for the pros? What, however you want to describe it. <laughs> I don't think there's such a thing as something that's just for pros or anything that's strictly beginner. It's like, is Ubuntu a beginner distro? Well, there's plenty of people that know a whole lot about Linux that use Ubuntu, like, that are, you know, pros at Linux that use Ubuntu. Oh, is it for beginners or is it for pros? It could be for either one, right? I think that's the, what most Linux distributions are. DTOS, you know, this particular post installation script is the same way. You you can probably be a noob and actually get this thing installed and figure out how to use it, and you could be a pro too. Uh, I'd say either or. Uh, Daniel says, hey, DT, are you accepting patronage from PayPal as much as you do in Patreon? So I do have a PayPal link. Uh, I don't typically list people that pay with PayPal uh, in the 
like credits of the show the way I do with Patreon, mainly because there's just no e easy way to manage that kind of stuff, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I, I, PayPal donations are welcome. There's PayPal links on YouTube and the channel header, I think in every show description as well. Let's see, you wouldn't be using Lisp if you really wanted to find a job as a developer. Not really the most recommended, not really the most requested language. I don't know. There's probably... I wouldn't say, yeah, you're right, Lisp isn't the most requested language, but it's not something really obscure either. It would probably be something that, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have on a resume. I'll just put it that way. Like the idea that you wasted your time learning this, uh, there's never, learning anything is never a waste of time. But I actually think, like if you went to a job, you know, that required some programming and you actually had a resume that included some Lisp stuff, I don't think that'd be a bad thing. Let's see. Uh, there is an open CAD package for Emacs. Huh. That's interesting. I don't do anything with, with CAD programs. But that doesn't surprise me that there's an Emacs pack. There's an Emacs package for practically any task that you want to accomplish. Uh, GROM says, love your videos. Appreciate that. Uh, we are already at the 90 minute mark, and I do need to be out of here in the next few minutes. But what I think I want to do here with the last part of the video, let's go ahead and push all the, the changes that we've made today to DTOS. Because this will take, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. I'm going to open up a graphical file manager. And I'm going to open up DTOS-Configs. So this is my uh, DTOS Configs repository. And what changes did we make today? I know I changed Xmonad a little bit. Let's copy over everything from my home directory into this git repo. Yeah, override everything. Uh, we don't need the compiled stuff though. Let's get rid of some of that. What else did we change? Um, alacrity. So let's go into slash etc slash dtos dot config alacrity and then in my home directory go into dot config alacrity and copy over the new alacrity config then we also need the local bin script for dtos dash color scheme so I'll go into home directory dot local bin DTOS color scheme. Copy that over. Am I missing anything? I played around a little bit in the Emacs config, but I didn't change anything. Uh, or nothing that I changed and then didn't immediately undo. Well, I think that is it. That D menu script, the changes in Xmonad, and of course the changes of the color scheme names and alacrity were the only thing I did in DTOS dash configs. Yeah. I think that's all I needed to do. So, cd into my GitLab repos, DTOS dash configs, git status, see, yeah, lots of things. Modified, anything, untracked. Ah, let me go back in the DTOS configs directory at C DTOS X monad because we had lib colors and once again we have a lot of compiled stuff because these uh, color modules once they're activated in X monad it actually compiles them <laughs> so let me get rid of everything that ends in dot hi or dot o 
only thing I want are the files that end in .hs. Well, it looks like I had chosen every color scheme at some point. I probably could have done that at the command line a lot quicker. All right, do I have you know, 10 files left? All of them are .hs, all right. Run that get status again. <laughs> yeah, okay, now, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah, everything looks good there. So get add dash u to add the updated files. Get add, we're gonna add slash etsy slash dt os um, local. And we gotta add the local bin dtos dash color scheme script and get commit. What is our commit message gonna be? Uh, adding color schemes with the menu script. And let's do a git push. And the reason I needed to do this first is because building the packages themselves requires dtos-config. So I needed to make sure to get that pushed. And now I'm going to cd into dtos-package build. Different repository. I do an ls. You see I've got two packages here, uh, two scripts, build packages and cleanup. I'm going to run the cleanup script just in case there's any crud <laughs> left around. Uh, and then I'm going to run build packages. And assuming this works without any errors, it will take five, maybe 10 minutes. It's going to ask for a couple of different passwords along the way, including uh, some GPG stuff. Do that off camera here. Because it's going to ask to sign everything as well. So all my packages are signed. So, so it's taking all the package builds in DTOS-package build and it's going to make binary packages out of them. It's essentially running the make package command on them. And assuming that goes without error, After that, uh, just I push some stuff to DTOS-core repo, and it should be immediately available to you guys if you're on DTOS. Hey, why do you say user and not USR for slash U? Because it's easier to say. Yeah, I know there's no E in it, and USR stands for Unix Service Repository or System Repository, what, whatever it's supposed to be, right? Nobody really knows what it originally stood for, but it has nothing to do with your user. Everybody knows that, but it's just easier to say slash user. Same thing with Etsy, right? I'm not going to say slash ETC. That's three syllables when slash Etsy is two syllables. If I can save a syllable, I'll do it. While this is you know, this is going to take a few minutes, uh, you guys may have noticed when I walked in <laughs> earlier, but I was, I've been playing around with creating a T-shirt. Uh, see if I can get this on camera. Since everybody loved that thumbnail. <laughs> I forget which uh, video I did that face on, but everybody, <laughs> you either loved that thumbnail or you hated it. I figured I'd make a t-shirt with it. Let's see. Miguel says, hey man, love your videos. Learn so much from watching. Thanks for your hard work. Thank you, Miguel. I appreciate that. Uh... Yeah, Windows XP is actually decent. Windows XP was a good version of Windows 20 years ago. <laughs> like, nobody should be running a machine with XP on it. Not now. And by the way, the bald by choice t-shirt. Of course, that's funny. You know, I created this for you people that are actually bald, right? Because I'm not bald, right? <laughs> Got hair, guys. 
Uh, all right, the uh, build packages script finally completed. So it just built those binaries. So I'm going to open up a new terminal because I'll need to come back to this one here in a minute. But a CD into GitLab repos DTOS dash core dash repo. This is where all of those binaries need to be placed. And I have this build dash database script here. So run that. What that does, it goes into DTOS dash package build, finds all the binary packages plus their signed files and moves them over to the appropriate place in DTOS dash core repo. This just takes a few seconds. And then all I need to do, go back to D2S dash package build. Go ahead and push the new package builds because they'll be updated with new version numbers. That happens automatically. So uh, I didn't actually have to go and manually change anything. I'm going to say uh, updating package builds. No reason to do a commit message more than that because there's really nothing else going on in that particular repository and in this one I'm gonna do a git add everything which is gonna take a minute because it's a few binary packages some of them are kinda of large alright then git commit um, git commit oh, can't type uh, updating database git push And that's going to take a minute. Again, some big packages. I'll come back in a second when that's done. Oh, let's see. Oh, we got somebody spamming. Let me go ahead, hide user on this channel. Oh, takes care of that guy. You'll never see him again. I don't know if his message was good or wasn't good. If he was uh, saying nice things about me, maybe he was insulting my mama. It really doesn't matter if you spam. You're just going to go away forever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do have to go. Uh, I'm just going to give this a few more minutes because I, I'm curious if these changes will take effect inside DTOS. As people do ask about updating DTOS, I'm actually going to show you that in a VM as soon as this last push completes. All right, and it looks like that completed. All right. That should be it. So let, let me open up this VM with DTOS installed on Manjaro KDE. And... Like I said, because as soon as I pushed all of that stuff, they should be immediately available to you guys. So I don't know what I'm typing. I was typing a really long and convoluted password there. All right. So open a terminal. And assuming everything went well, me uh, pushing those new packages. If I do a sudo pacman dash capital S lowercase y u, the standard way you update all Arch Linux distributions, you see there are new builds for dmenu dash distro tube, dtos dash alacrity, uh, dtos dash backgrounds and local bin, dtos dash xmonad, you know, all of the particular scripts and packages for dtos. Any package that begins with DTOS dash. Oh, looks like there was an error. Uh, DWM dash distro tube already exists. Uh, I guess it didn't like. DWM dash distro tube already being here. Maybe there is an error with that. I haven't played with DWM in a while, so that's why. Somebody else was reporting that there may be an error earlier. There probably is. So let me uh, remove DWM from the system and now run the update. Okay, everything installs just fine. Every package with DTOS dash as part of the name 
like DTOS-X wallpaper, you know. And it'll actually say that config file was placed in slash Etsy slash DTOS slash dot cache slash wall. Or DTOS-ZSH, which is a ZSH config file. That gets placed in slash Etsy slash DTOS slash dot ZSHRC. Think of this essentially as a placeholder for home, right? <laughs> there, other than that, it's essentially a home directory. It's just not your home directory because I can't, again, I, I don't want to overwrite your existing configs. So if I actually go into CD into slash Etsy, DTOS, and did a LS, you know, let's think of that as like a home directory, right? You have your bash RC, your ZSHRC, your dot config directory, which has the alacrity config, the fish config, uh, all of that stuff. You got dot X monad here as well. A CD into dot X monad, doing LS. You know, there's all of that, including the new lib uh, with colors in it, those color modules as well. So if you want the new Xmonad config with the colors, what you would do is you would copy over this stuff. And you'd copy, well, we're already in this directory. Let's just uh, yeah, copy everything to slash home. I believe my user is DT on this. And this obviously needs to go into home slash dot Xmonad. Uh, we got to do recursively because there's some subdirectories here. Uh, it's going to ask about overriding everything. It's going to ask it a million times because I've got that alias to always ask. Let's not do the alias for copy. Uh, how about slash bin slash copy? There. <laughs> All right. And now let me reload Xmonad. Yeah, recompiles and restarts just fine. And I go into dot xmonad and I actually open the readme.org. Let's open it with Emacs. This is going to take a second because that's not using the Emacs server. That was just the standard Emacs command. But what I wanted to see is, do I have the uh, imports here? Yeah, import colors dot doom one. Yeah, so that is the new config. And if I do super PC for that color script, I don't have it because we need to copy it as well. So I'm going to CD space period period to go up a directory because I want to CD into dot local slash bin. Then we want to copy dtos dash color scheme over to slash home slash dt dot local slash bin uh, there and now super pc uh, still doesn't give us that script why not it's here Maybe it's not executable. Yeah, it's not executable. So CD into dot local dot bin. If I do an LS, yeah, it's not executable. Let's ch mod it. And now DTOS dash color scheme is executable, right? And now Super P C launches it. I change the color schemes to solarized light. Uh, Alacrity is going to complain because we didn't copy over the Alacrity config. But everything's working just fine. Oop. I tried to m move a floating window, but of course, what it does is it doesn't respect that I'm in a VM. So. All right, so what I want to do here, CD up a level, actually CD up a level again, CD into dot slash Etsy slash DTOS dot config slash alacrity, and then let's copy the alacrity dot YML over to slash home slash DT slash dot config slash 
Alacrity, and well, I don't need to name it. It'll know what to name it. And the error immediately goes away, you know, once I copied that file over. So now, Super PC, if I wanted to change to Monokai Pro, yeah, Exmo Bar changed, Trayer changed, Alacrity changed, the Conky changed. <laughs> no, all right, so it is kind of convoluted how you have to go about copying all of that over from slash Etsy slash DTOS over to the home directory. But again, I can't just overwrite your existing configs uh, because that would just be messy. If I did that, you know, some people would complain because they would already have highly customized configs that I would mess up. So that's unfortunately the way we have to do it. Somebody earlier also asked me about why don't I just use slash Etsy slash skill? which is on every Linux system, you know, it's already there. It's kind of what that directory is meant for, is your distribution's custom configs. The problem is DTOS isn't a real distribution. If you're installing this on Manjaro, Manjaro uses slash Etsy slash skill for its own stuff, its own packages. Things get installed to slash Etsy slash skill. So I can't install my stuff there either, because I'm going to be trying to overwrite Manjaro's packages there, or their packages, when they update, will be trying to overwrite my, my packages, it'll cause conflicts. So that's why I created slash Etsy slash DTOS for that. Because nobody's going to use that directory, right? Because that's not a normal directory, right? That's just a, a name, a directory I made up. All right, so we're coming up on a couple of hours, and I do have to get going here in just a few minutes. I'm going to spend about three or four minutes catching up on the chat, and then I'm going to head out, guys. Yeah, uh, Maximo, thanks for all DT. Appreciate that. Uh, Mnemonic says, hair is bloat. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I have a full head. So, uh, I feel bad for the guys that are bald, though. Because if I'm not bald, but people make fun of me for being bald, I can only imagine if I was bald, man, it would be horrible. <laughs> uh, yeah, being bald is for minimalist people. ADT, I've been using your Xmonad question. How would I change the panel's time to a 12-hour format instead of a 24-hour format? I think it uses just the standard uh, date time format from like a, a standard command line format. So um, you'd have to go in the Xmonad configs. So that's going to be in dot config slash, or not the xmobar config so dot config slash xmobar slash and then whatever color scheme you happen to be using so that's doom one it's doom dash one dash xmobar rc zoom in there will be a module in here for the clock uh, date right here run date and then this here you see this format here percent b percent d percent capital Y, percent capital H, colon, percent capital M. And you want a 24 hour time. Oh, wait, I'm already using 24 hour time. You want 12 hour time. Well, let me see if I can find your question. Yeah, you want 12 hour time, okay. So instead of capital H, I believe it's just a lowercase h. So if I change that. Restart. Uh, no, capital uh, lowercase h is actually the month. <laughs> so it's not that I'd have to man page it. If I open a terminal and do date, you know, there is a date command, right? Oh, my, my bad, I hit the wrong man date. And does it give the, uh, yeah, it gives you all the values. Just read this. So 12 hour time, percent capital I. See, I do read man pages occasionally. They are useful. And now, give it a second to load. Yeah, and now it's 354 instead of 15. 54. So that's how you do that. And I'll put that back though to the what it was because I don't want to accidentally get that thing pushed to DTOS or something. So there you go. 
But yeah, so that's just a standard date format. That's a standard command line uh, tool on Unix systems. Just read man date if you're ever wondering about time and date formatting. Uh, Doffer says, love your content. Open source fan because of you. Appreciate that. And thank you for supporting free and open source software. <laughs> that, is the mis mi that is the mission here, right? It's, I don't care if you guys actually use Linux or not. I mean, I like Linux, but it's more of, yeah, it's about free and open source software in general. It's, I mean, Linux could die tomorrow. I mean, things change, things come and go. But I think, you know, the message of free and open source software is the message that I'm trying to preach. And I hope those of you that are willing to listen and, uh, you know, like I said, I think free and open source software in many ways is changed the way I thought about computers and software and just life in general for the better. And I hope it does the same for you guys. And before I go, because I do have to get out of here, I will thank the patrons. So I'm going to thank the executive producers here. Devin, Gabe, James, Matt, Michael, Mitchell, Paul, Scott, Wes, and then also Akami, Alan, Linux, Ninja, Chuck, Commander, Angry, Kurt, Dai, Okai, David, Dylan, Gregory, Heiko, Koska, Lee, Maxim, Mike, Nitrix, Arion, Alexander, Peace, Arjun, Fedora, Polly, Shake, Raver, Red Prophet, Steven, and Willie. These guys, they're awesome. They're my highest tier patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, I couldn't do what I do. I also couldn't do what I do without each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't really have any corporate sponsors because corporate sponsors wouldn't like me anyway. I'm not a corporate sponsor kind of guy. I just have you guys, the community. If you like my work, guys, go check out DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace.